Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium, where we are now going through some code on fraud prediction. So I've created a video on this um, a couple of months ago in the past where I went mostly through the theory of like how chargebacks are created and some of the nitty gritty details, but at a theoretical level of what happens when customers like file for chargebacks, what happens when they file for claims. Now let's actually use machine learning in order to predict whether or not a customer will create a claim or try to file for a chargeback at the time that they make the purchase itself. So transaction fraud, it's a, a pretty common problem that people tend to tackle when dealing with machine learning, especially from the get-go. I do know that a lot of people tend to tackle it from the, from the perspective of anomaly detection or treat it as uh, an unsupervised problem as such. But in this approach, we're actually going to look at a typical supervised approach of satisfying and trying to solve for um, predicting um, transaction fraud at the time of purchase. So with that, let's just, uh, let's just get started. So right now we have a pretty solid concrete problem definition. Given past transactions, try to determine if the current transaction is fraudulent, right? And now with, with the data source, it's pretty cool. We have a little Kaggle data source, which is massive. There's like a, this train CSV is like, like what, 300 M megabytes. Um, I'll just go through a couple of the col columns here so that we know what data we're looking at. Uh, we have credit card number, pretty, pretty nice. All of this, by the way, is synthetic data. So it's not like somebody else's credit card information is just shown on Kaggle. We have a transaction date, credit card number, the merchant name, uh, what was the item that was purchased and amount amount is like the price of that item followed by some user details and this is just 10 rows of the 40 or 10 columns of the 46 actual columns that we have to work with one of these columns is also whether you know i think there's like a column that says fake or not is yeah is fraud or is not fraud so it's a binary variable right here that i could i could check as well and that would be mostly our label for this data. So now, interestingly, all of this data was generated uh, kind of by this, uh, but there, there's like a little repository here from which they got the data. And this person or rather used Faker, which is a Python library to generate fake data. And you can kind of see, you know, certain, certain fields just being populated with with just fake data over here. So be sure to check that out if you're really interested in just generating synthetic data. It's fairly useful, I think, when uh, dealing with problems in data science where you know, you're know you not able to actually use real data from some real database. So that's fun stuff. All right, so now coming to the to the actual, like looking at the data, you know, that data set for training is huge. Uh, but we cannot really train on those millions and millions of rows. And so what I do is I just sample 100,000 rows, which is 100,000 transactions, and then make use of that for like training and testing, right? And it works just as well. So if you look at that, this is transaction data. I have 100,000 transactions sampled for, from like beginning of 2019 to mid 2020, and there's 575 fraudulent transactions that have occurred which is pretty reasonable, kind of realistic data right here that we got. So let's work with this. Now, in order to identify, I wanna um, kind of make use of regression, right? So the idea is to predict whether or not a person has committed fraud or at, at present. And what we wanna do is we wanna look at all the past historical data and the historical behavior of that particular customer. So we gotta make sure that, you know, we're able to get all of the data with just like a single identification. In this case, I could just use the credit card ID as the unique user identification. Um, I'm doing this check here just to make sure that, you know, one unique user is mapped to one unique credit card, just to make sure, you know, like there may be some cases where a user has multiple credit cards or like a credit card might be tied to multiple users if, you know, users live in the same household. But it looks like none of those complications exist and we don't need to resolve those entities right here. Um, and it's pretty cut and dry. So I just used the credit card number as the identification. But this is something that you would really need to look into when you are dealing with real data. So let's go to feature engineering right now. Um, 
the thing is with these labels that you see, like that I talked about the binary label of is fake and, or sorry, is fraud and is not fraud. You actually don't get those labels offhand. Like as soon as the transaction is made, you won't know whether a transaction is fraudulent unless a customer actually comes back to you and says, hey, I see like a transaction that was made on my card, um, you know, two weeks ago. Can you like deal with this? Because that was a fraudulent transaction. It didn't occur. And it's only then that you get a label right there. And so you would ideally what you would need to do in order to get this data set is to wait for a certain amount of time and then say, OK, after this certain time, you can say that 97 percent of people um, tend to uh, either claim that their transaction was fraudulent or not. And it's only then that you actually have the labels. So let's say that, you know, I'm in a company right now like that has this kind of data and I don't have access to the historical data in this particular context, but if I did, and in a real company I would, what I would want to do is like plot some graph that looks like this. So the x-axis is the days until the fraudulent claim, and the y-axis is what percentage of the total claims came in, um, you know, before the said day on the x-axis. So in this case, I see like a bunch of people started filing claims, you know, until like maybe 60, 70 days out. But then at 90 days, it really starts flattening out, which means that after 90 days, you can see it's almost 100 percent, like 98 percent, maybe or something like that. So that means 98 percent of the time that a claim is filed, it would have come within the first 90 days. So we can kind of use that as a label. Um, when actually creating our data set, which you will see when uh, I introduce you to the SQL file that is used to create the training set. But before then, um, before you actually write any of the SQL, you want to kind of take a doc out and then just think about like, what are the factors that would affect whether a transaction is fraudulent or not fraudulent? And um, I've kind of explained this in the other video, but basically you want to do this exercise so that you have like, okay, what is the criteria? of you know determining whether fraudulent or not fraudulent how do you think what is your hunch on how the behavior is and then and then go about actually analyzing the data to verify those hunches so in this case let's say the first thing that comes to mind what is the indic what is the indicator of fraudulent behavior well has this person have uh, has this how many like trans past transactions were both fraudulent and non-fraudulent by this customer I would think that more fraudulent uh, past behavior indicates like this may be another fraudulent transaction, for example. And then I would go and verify that with the data. And the second, I would do the same with the merchants. We have merchant data, remember? So we can try to see if, okay, like let's see that if this merchant is uh, legit as well. Sometimes there may be like coercion between the buyer and the merchant. They might be working together to dupe the company. We don't know. And so we want to also validate this. The next is purchase amount. I would think that, you know, for like larger purchases, like maybe products of like $10,000, you might see that like fraudulent transactions do tend to occur a little more. But again, you would need to verify this. Then location. So with location, it's, I'm mostly doing location because, you know, in typical e-commerce companies, you know, when you do a delivery service with like Amazon or UPS, whatever, they, like UPS, right? So the chances are that like, if you live in a shady area, you, the, per, the, com, the customer might just file a claim um, that their package has been stolen, but even though it's not like fraudulent, but that's only because like they live in a shady area and that's kind of why they're doing it. And so that's why I've added this as an indicator. So if they, it, so it would, you know, location you can kind of pass in as like a categorical variable to your, to your model, right? Um, now I want to take all of this information. There might be so much more that uh, we can probably, you know, scrimmage from this data. But let's just take this information and then try to create our data set for uh, training. And so I have this like base.sql, right? Queries slash base.sql. So let's open that file and it looks like this. So from the get go, it's a bunch of CTEs that, um, you know, you can use to, which I strongly recommend that if you don't really have a good grasp on SQL, I highly recommend you learn about how, you know, you should be writing SQL in general with common table expressions so that it just becomes easier to see rather than like nested queries. So let's just look at this first CTE, just getting information from the transaction. Basically, um, it's just the entire, like I'm just getting the data, you know, just wh whatever I have in my data frame, which is DF. All of this, by the way, is being, um, I'm able to write SQL here because of uh, Pandas SQL. So it's easy for me to just write, write SQL rather than like operating on Pandas data frame with data frame operations, which to me is a lot harder than just writing native SQL, hence I'm using it. Okay, so now you have this other CTE for past transactions. And the goal for me to do, for me here is like, 
For every single user ID, which basically is credit card number, I want to get the total number of past transactions that have occurred and also the number of, um, and also like if there's nothing, it would just be zero, for example. And what was the average price of those transactions? And remember, I'm only considering transactions that happened over three months ago because it's only at that point that I would actually have labels and I don't wanna use anything beyond that three month mark. like from like the last three months from today, if I wanted to evaluate, because my label doesn't exist for the, if it was fraudulent, right? And so I get, you know, all this past information right here. Now I'm doing this now, this is just like past transaction information. And I write the same CTE for fraudulent, just to determine like how many cases were number of transactions that were fraudulent in the past. And the only difference between the first and the second CTE is this that fraudulent transaction dot is fraud is equal to one so it only this so this counter will only have just the fraudulent transaction count and i do the exact same thing for these two cdes but on the merchant side so how many um transactions did i have and how many of them were fraudulent right and then i combine all of that together in just this final um, sql expression where i'm just doing a bunch of left joins uh, on the original transactions and in this, like you can see that I am also saying, okay, if the if the location really isn't if if the location isn't known or it's like it's missing, you want to just populate it with UNK, which is unknown. Um, and also, like if you know if there are no transactions at all, sometimes it will be null there too. And I want that I want that to actually be true because no past transactions is true in this case. And I think you can infer the same from all of these all of the other uh, functions here. Now, obviously I'm like, you cannot do a divide by zero. Like I wanted to do fraud rate and I wanted to see if this would be like a, a, a good feature to use. Uh, I cannot divide by zero. If, the, if there are no transactions that the user has made and this is the first transaction, this will throw a divide by zero error. And that's why I'm putting, I'm wrapping this in a case when um, statement. And I'm doing that same for like the merchant fraud rate as well. So that's like a really quick overview of like how the data set is constructed. And remember, we are only using data until three months ago because that is the data for which we have like an accurate label. Beyond three months, we just don't have the labels, right? Hope that makes sense. And I, I hope you get that, right? So now once you actually construct that data, the result of that here is like a single, um, a line of like the features for a particular transaction. So the label was zero, so there was no, even three months later, there was no, there was no claim that was made that this was a fraudulent transaction by the customer, right? And yeah, that's it. Uh, now with location, you see 904. I, if you see that that was, I used the zip zone prefix, so essentially just extracting the first three digits of the zip code. Because if you extract too much, then that means that like it's just too too many categorical features. If it's too little, it's gonna be less important of a feature because zip code is actually indicative of regions. It's pretty important, it's pretty cool to know of how zip zones are created. Now, um, creating the model, right? So first of all, I have this function for creating, for undersampling. Uh, you'll see this later when I, when I use it here. Uh, let me actually just go through this a little bit first. So I have a bunch of categorical and numerical features that I think are, that I've just like manually put into this. And from here, I am splitting the test set and the train set in a, in a 10 is to one ratio. So there's like 100,000 samples, 90,000 will be trained, 10,000 will be test. And I'm not, I'm choosing not to shuffle so that, you know, we're not predicting on data that happened any time before the training set data. If you shuffle it, you might suffer from like data leakage issues, which is pretty bad and a very common mistake among, um, you know, when you're starting out with machine learning. Um, but the thing is that you don't want to train and you don't want to literally train on this directly because uh, something that we're seeing here is data imbalances. There's only like 500 or so fraudulent transactions, right? But there's like 90,000, 90 to 100,000 of like total transactions. This great imbalance will mean that if the model just keeps on spewing out non-fraudulent, non-fraudulent for every single thing, so just like a def return false, then your model will technically perform super well. Now, precision, obviously the precision is like near the zero, but I'm just saying like in general, your accuracy would be pretty high and you don't want, you want your model to be able to pick up on these little anomalies. 
And so in order to cater to that, I created this um, function called undersample, which will basically undersample the train set. So if I only have 500 of these samples in the, the, fraud, the like positive labels, it will make sure that the ratio of negative to positive is at most just four. So if I have 500, that means I will only have 2000 of the negative samples. And that's what, a, what I'm kind of doing here where I'm just sampling uh, just to make sure that we take care of the data imbalance situation. So we're technically under sampling the, the data set from the, from the negative label because there's just so many of them. Um, I hope this pace isn't too fast, but I'm just trying to get through all these ideas and you can probably like look through the notebook and understand with more details just by looking line by line at the code and probably just Googling certain things too because I'm hoping that it's not too two out of the box. So right now for categorical features, uh, we're, this is like a typical pipeline structure that I do encourage everybody to learn of how like when they create models, it's a great way to pipe in from pre-processing all the way to model um, classification. So the way I'm doing this is like all the categorical variables are going to be pre-processed in this way. They're going to be imputed by a simple imputer from scikit-learn and we're going to impute it with a value of negative one. And then I'm going to do some ordinal encoding, which will basically start ordering all the categorical variables with integer values. And for the numeric variables, I'm just imputing it with the, the there's no, there's no um, parameter. So it just takes the mean of the column value and just imputes or rather fills the values that are NA into that uh, cell. And then what we're doing is uh, creating a cat boost classifier. So cat boost, very fun. Um, we're going to be creating that classifier and then piping all of our pre-processed data into this classifier and then fitting the model on the undersampled uh, train data. And so you can see, well, uh, over like what, 1,000 1, iterations, the, the, the loss is definitely decreasing. The model is learning right now. And, um, and as far as evaluation is concerned, you know, because of there's such like a huge data imbalance, um, we want to make sure that we are taking into account both precision and recall correctly. So instead of using the typical AUC, ROC AUC curve, we're using a precision recall AUC curve because precision recall are super important to consider when you're dealing with data imbalances, right? And so um, I'm kind of taking all of this into, into account over here. Uh, and we have train and test metrics. Uh, yeah, I'm just evaluating that. And looky here, we have pretty good, we're actually doing pretty good with, uh, with our metrics over here. So, I mean, like even the AUC, ROC is like in the 80%. I mean, that could be reasonable depending on what situation that you're, you're dealing with. And then as far as the confusion matrix is concerned, though, this is, I think, like super important because it kind of tells you the breakdown of how many fraudulent transactions we predicted, how many fraudulent transactions were actually there, and then uh, trying to see how many we got right. So we know, let's just look at the test set because that's what we're concerned with. There's like, if you sum these up, there's like 10,000 transactions or so, right? Now, if you look at it, there's 58 cases where you know there were actually fraudulent transactions. These 58, they were actually fraud, but we um, and we actually predicted fraudulent, which is great. Now, these are five cases where that was actually fraud, but we didn't predict them fraudulent. So we missed these, which is bad. But overall, for the 63 cases that were fraudulent, we picked up 58 of them, which is pretty good. Pretty good, actually, I guess. Yeah. And then um, there's 124 cases that we predicted were fraudulent, but weren't actually fraudulent. So these are like, um, you know, our model just gave false positives too, which is, which is fine. It seems like a low reasonable number. And these are just the typical true negatives where, you know, we just normal transactions that just pass through, which is good, right? So overall, it looks like our model is already performing pretty good. Um, that's great. But the thing is right now, if somebody comes up to me like a stakeholder and says, okay, this is great and all, you have a model, but like, what, what, what are the most important factors that are contributing to this model? Like what determines a fraudulent transaction the most? And to them, well, we have model interpretability using Shapley values. So Shap is, um, it's a, it's a library that's used for uh, visualizing these, um, you know, the importance of certain features in models. Now, I've made an entire video on this, but essentially it uses game theory in order to, it's like all these features are now competing in order to see like, okay, if 
um, the sample is fraudulent. What exactly is making it fraudulent? There is some some amount of space that is allocated to each feature. So w it, the total of them should be like, okay, if we have this much space. What is actually making it fraudulent? This divergence, what's causing that divergence? And so all of your features would fit into this um, with different points and different ratios. And it would be scored proportionally to like how effective it is. And now in this case, it's saying that, well, the price is the is by far the most important feature. So I, it doesn't give any sense of direction, but my hunch is like, okay, typically if it's a higher price, chances are that it's most likely like, okay, you gotta be careful of this one, right? And then after that is no merchant fraudulent past transactions. So if a merchant has had fraudulent past transactions, you know, okay, you gotta be careful of this. And interestingly, even category. So it's like, depending on the item that is also being purchased, it seems to have a pretty high weight. So when actually looking at that, I think I did that analysis a little later. Let me just hop to this. So category was interesting because it's like people who bought shopping nets and grocery and whatever these are, like they actually had a higher tendency of, um, of actually filing for a claim or, you know, making these fraudulent transactions. I jumped ahead of myself a little bit, but let's just uh, continue here. Um, I wanted to also look at there, you know, SHAP is a great library for visualizing these things. You can visualize it at like the overall data set level of feature importance or even at like the transaction level. So let's say that this is an example transaction where, you know, we predicted the model, there was not fraud and the predicted, the prediction was also not fraud. So why exactly did the model make the prediction in the way that we did given these features? Well, we have like, um, so here is like the entire uh, gist of like, you know, these each additional feature and their contribution. Blue and downwards just mean that it's decreasing the probability. Red and upward means that it's increasing the probability of uh, being detected as fraudulent. So it's saying that, okay, the biggest factor is the price is super cheap. It's like 6.84. That's probably why. And there is never, there is no merchant fraudulent past transactions. So the merchant has never made any fraudulent past transactions, which is also a huge indicator. And then there's also all these other things that are huge indicators. And that's why it's, um, it's, it's kind of pushing it down. Right. And, um, that's also why like it's pretty low. Next is let's just take another look at another example, but this is a fraudulent sample. It's actually fraudulent and our model correctly predicted it as being fraudulent. But why was it being predicted as fraudulent? So it looks like the price is over a thousand bucks. Whatever this item was, um, yeah, this shopping net, it was over a thousand bucks and that's really contributing to the fact that, okay, you gotta look into this, this might be fraudulent. But then there's also the category is equal to 11, which is surprising. This is like the second most important factor. And category 11 is essentially um, shopping net. And like I said before, it's when I just tried to look at that, I thought that was super interesting. But like people who tend to purchase shopping nets, the, the fraudulent transactions for those is actually the highest among all other types of items that are being purchased, which is a really fun fact that you can see in the data. And you could probably pick up on so many other samples just by looking at them too. So. That's kind of all I got for this entire uh, notebook, but there are certain other um, questions that I would answer in addition to these. Like one of them is like the actual model, model interpretability. Like I mentioned, like this, this SHAP graph right here, it doesn't give the directional importance. Like I know that price really has a pretty strong indicator of like whether something is fraudulent or not, but like, what does that mean? What is that dependence like? Is it higher the price? Is it lower the price? What is it? My hunch is obviously higher the price, but you can figure this out and also make sure that that is the case by plotting partial dependency plots. So it'll be partial dependency plots will be plots of the actual feature value versus the um, versus uh, the actual regressed or whatever this categorical value. And just trying to see like how, how that probability would vary just depending on varying this one feature, keeping out all the other features as constant. So try to plot those partial dependency plots and see what you get. It'll be pretty interesting to also verify your hunches just to make sure that the model is performing in a way that you would think it would. And that is super important when you're dealing with data science in the real world. So partial dependency plots, very fun. Another thing that you can look at is um, try to use model interpretation on, um, you know, Shapley values can be used for on any model. I just used it on CatBoost here, but you can use it on XGBoost, even neural networks. 
whatever you want. So you can try even replacing this model and trying to see, you know, how what what changes in the model interpretability and also the performance right here. Like, does this graph change by much? If so, which features change? And you can check that out. Try to try to replace the cap boost model, put something else in. And I think it's gonna be it's not gonna be too hard because we have this like pipeline architecture that we set up. So essentially all you need to do is just like you just need to make a couple of changes here and everything else should like remain the same, right? So plug and play for you know these this like machine learning pipeline makes it super simple, and that's why machine learning pipelines are very fun and very important. So I encourage you to try that out. If not, if you can't, if you get you know stuck on a roadblock, I've created an entire video and also notebook explaining SHAP and also interpretation of Shapley values um, all over here in this new notebook. And I encourage you to check it out as well. I have an entire video on that too. So that's kind of all I have today. Again, you can treat fraud detection, it's and fraud prediction, I should say, as like a problem of regression or rather classification rather than, um, you know, some separate anomaly detection-esque kind of problem. And it's not too hard to do, but it is a little different in terms of data collection because we just don't have the labels up front. So I hope this really helps understand a really common problem that I've seen in, uh, in uh, at least in Kaggle and in just getting up to speed in machine learning. Hope you enjoyed everything here, learned something new, and I will see you all in the next one. Yes, I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.